Yeah, John, welcome again. I think this is the third time you've, you've spoken at our uh, at our conference. And you know, John is the, the chief executive officer of Sprott Asset Management. Uh, he's a, a principal director at Sprott, and you know, it's probably uh, uh, single handedly driven the, uh, the spot market back into uh, back into the into the into the limelight with the establishment of the Spot Physical Uranium Trust uh, you know, two or three years ago, which. Um, you know, has has completely um, uh, changed the, the dynamic around that spot market, and um, you know John's insights into you know the setting up of spot and and, and what that vehicle is now doing are, are going to be crucial to understand what's happening in the uh, in the spot market. So, John, look, I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much for joining us again, and um, over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you for the intro, and and thanks everybody for making time to talk about a subject that we're very passionate about, which is uranium. Um, I think at Sprott, we're managing almost $8 billion US dollars in uranium-related investments. So it's been uh, wildly successful for our clients and our firm in terms of the amount of capital. And obviously, the returns have been really great. And you know, if I reflect on where we were two, three years ago, we, we really just talked about one thing, which was we have a structural supply deficit. And guess what? Uh, three years later, we still have a structural supply deficit. But um, what I think is more interesting is that the structural supply deficit, uh, it, based on our research, doesn't look to be solvable in the very you know, uh, intermediate term. And then I would say more importantly, we've had a massive shift in public sentiment and political support for nuclear energy, which is now making this story not just a supply deficit based uh, investment thesis, but one that's also driven by uh, grow, uh, re the return of growth to nuclear energy after a very, very long uh, hiatus. And joining me on the call, um, Per Yandir from WMC Energy is, is, is also available. Um, he is part of our technical advisory team, which helps us to keep an eye on what's going on in the uranium market every day. They help us with all of our procurement. Um, and uh, I'd also like to leave enough time at the, at the end for questions, because I always find uranium investors are super engaged and like to get in the weeds. So, I'm um, going to make sure I leave enough time, but just for some maybe level setting and, and just to bring some people up the curve in terms of what's been going on in the market, the last, uh, I would say, six or so months is really what's been interesting. Uh, from our perspective, things really started getting interesting in August of last year. And you might say, well, what's the big deal about August? Well, August is traditionally a, a very quiet market in a uh, time of year in the uranium market seasonally. Uh, very slow. A lot of the industry decides to kind of take it off. But we saw something happen that was out of character. We saw the uranium price uh, move up, breaking out of a kind of a, a range bound several months. We saw uh, quite a bit of activity in the spot market. And I think we learned subsequent weeks after what was driving all of that. And, and, and our belief is that clearly um, some producers were in the market because they were having some production challenges. Uh, and, you know, the, the utilities have been much more active uh, in the last 12 months or so. So let's just jump into it and, and just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what we've seen since September. I'll come back to it in a minute. But, you know, the investment case, as, as Andrew mentioned, um, yes, uh, you, you know, I think we can all be a little cynical about political photo ops. But COP28, I think, was quite symbolic because... If you think about the pledge that was made by 20 plus countries, including big countries like the United States, uh, to triple nuclear power by 2050, th this really represents a, a, a fundamental shift in energy policy. Uh, remember, at COP26 in Scotland, just two years prior to this, uh, the nuclear uh, energy industry was barely allowed at the event, and there was all kinds of protests because they had some uh, some representation there. So. It's 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 really remarkable. And this is really about three things. One, governments have said there's no way they're going to hit decarbonization and net zero targets if they phase out nuclear power. That's unequivocally become fact and, and, and openly acknowledged. Uh, the last two years, the, the mindsets around energy security have obviously changed uh, on the back of the energy shock we saw in 2022. And then the third thing is really about baseload energy and its growing importance. Uh, in a world that is becoming highly intermittent, as the world has deployed record amounts of, of uh, wind and solar last year, and the types of energy requirements that we're going to require going forward are going to require baseload, very clean baseload power. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a slide or two. So 
And this is just uh, some some scrapes of headlines that I've collected. And this is just in the last few weeks. This is not like the last two years. This is just the last couple of uh, couple of months, actually. And I think it's a really good uh, representation of the sea change uh, in terms of uh, how media is approaching this. But they're just really, you know, reporting on different energy policy shifts that we're seeing. So whether it's, you know, the New York Times talking about the U.S. seeking to boost nuclear power after decades of inertia, I think that sums it up perfectly. The industry was basically forgotten about for 30 odd years. Um, when you, and you know, just last week, the European Union, now it's not all nations, you know, as part of the EU, but there was a very large nuclear energy summit last week and there is an equal push going on there. This was unheard of two years ago. Um, it's not just about moving back to nuclear energy. It's also about expedizing the approval of power plants, new designs, small modular reactors, governments saying they need to expedite and streamline the permitting uh, of new mines because we've become uh, completely dependent on other countries for 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 uh, large amounts of our supply chains um this is really interesting and i uh, it, it represents a sea change in energy policy but i think from an investment perspective the stigma of investing in uranium and nuclear energy is largely gone uh, we will still hit institutions in places like Germany or Italy, where they're still totally anti-nuclear, but more and more uh, of, of, of the marketing I do around the globe to institutions, the stigma and some of the legacy misconceptions, I think, have kind of gone by the wayside. And I think that's very important for, for the investment thesis as well. I'm not going to go through all this, but it's just a quick snapshot of how many countries have kind of flipped in the last two years. Uh, it's right around the globe. With the exception of Germany and Spain, uh, everyone else has kind of flipped back to nuclear energy. Um, this one I'm going to talk about, uh, kind of an emerging use case that is becoming, I think, just, just starting to become understood. And that is the, uh, the likelihood that we're going to be needing a lot more energy, not just in emerging markets that are growing, you know, their, their use of energy per capita relative to the West, but in the West, where energy consumption has largely been flat for 15 to 20 years because of energy efficiency, utilities are now starting to message to the, to the marketplace that their customers are telling them they need more energy going forward. And what's driving it are a few things. One, reshoring of manufacturing back to places like the United States. Um, we've seen huge investments announced and underway in all things from solar panel construction to EV production to other technologies focused on hydrogen, et cetera. These are all gonna be more uh, energy intensive. Related to technology, everything is being digitized, everything's going in the cloud, and then you've got AI. If you, if you listen to what Microsoft is telling you, uh, chat GBT alone, they estimate is gonna require 10,000 megawatts of energy to run. It's mind boggling. So 10,000 megawatts of energy is about 10 nuclear reactors. Um, this is an interesting story from Amazon just a few weeks ago. They bought a nuclear power data center from a company called Talon. This idea of co-location, co meaning you have things like data centers that need 24-7 power. They basically set up shop next to a stable source like a nuclear power station. This one happens to be in Pennsylvania. They will also tap into renew renewable energy that does not go into the grid. The energy simply goes into data centers. Microsoft, Meta, Google, Apple, they all want to scale up these technologies and they all want them powered from clean energy sources. So whether it's geothermal, nuclear power, wind and solar, uh, they're all trying to build very clean carbon footprints. This is just starting to bubble up to the, to the investment community, but I think it's going to be something very interesting to watch. Um, think the other thing that we closely watch is obviously the uranium contracting cycle, and, and Treba will probably talk about this when she comes on, but this is very important. There's a very high correlation between uh, how much uranium utilities are buying on long-term contracts and the price of uranium with this big shift back to nuclear power and the planned build-out of nuclear power across the world. Uh, we believe that we're still in the very early stages of this contracting cycle. Last year, there was a lot of excitement about 160 million pounds contracted to buy to or purchased by utilities under long-term contracts. I think you have to 
take a step back and 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 net out the fact that there was a 60 million pound purchase alone by the Ukrainians as they're moving away from Russia as a long-term supplier. If you net out that 60 million one-time purchase, I think it's fair to say we're not yet at replacement rate contracting and utilities we think still have a lot more uranium to buy. All right, let's keep going. So with this backdrop of of, you know, your of uranium demand growing from basically almost zero to one, two percent, and more recently estimates have been three to four percent per annum. Uh, where are we going to get this uranium from? And, and this just is a friendly reminder just to tell you that it is very concentrated in a small number of countries. Uh, most of them are not in the West. Luckily and thankfully, uh, places like Australia and Canada, where I live, um, do have uh, good deposits of uranium and, and I think are going to be huge beneficiaries of capital. But other countries, obviously, in Africa, I think are very well positioned to, to meet the, the growing demand for uranium. We bring this up because it is we are still in a period of heightened geopolitical risk uh, with Kazakhstan uh, being essentially the OPEC of uranium production. The Western uh, JV partners in Kazakhstan are still opting to not take delivery of their uranium through um, the traditional route, which is up, up by rail to St. Petersburg. They are moving it through the Transcaspian route, which is more time consuming and costly. It is it is happening, albeit on a much slower pace than than is the traditional route. Um, Russia obviously is very important in the nuclear fuel supply chain. And there is a bill that kind of starts and stops in the United States that will ban the importation of Russian uranium, which uh, there will be waivers in place. But I think Treva will give you more insights around the importance of that. I, I personally think it's going to change the psychology of the fuel buyers, knowing that there is now a finite time whereby they can no longer uh, rely on Russia as a supplier and we'll have to find other sources. That's obviously creating a lot of, um, I think, opportunity to build out Western capacity, which is happening, albeit very slowly. We've seen a number of plant restarts and plant expansion plans announced in the United States, Canada, and, and around Europe. Uh, the big challenge is going to be time, how long it takes to get these, these facilities scaled up, and whether Russia retaliates in any way and cuts the West off before the hard deadline of uh, 20, the end of 2027. So that, that's something we're, we're watching. I, I just mentioned this. This is about basically the reshoring of the nuclear fuel supply chain. Uh, this is something we watch pretty, pretty carefully. So if you put it all together, um, uh, you know, the demand forecast, I'm, in, in this model here, we're borrowing it from Cantor Fitzgerald. They're just simply borrowing the WNA, the World Nuclear Association, uh, a forecast that they put out in September that shows the annual requirements for uranium will go somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 million pounds to 300 million pounds per annum. And you can see that the primary production of uranium is, is uh, gradually scaling down um, as mines, existing mines come to end of life. Yes, there are a whole flurry of restarts and some new mines being planned. And I think uh, it's very encouraging that the industry uh, actually has a chance to, to actually build out new capacity in this cycle. But even with the restart of some mines, um, we're going to need a lot more uranium. And uh, depending on what forecast you want to use, the estimates I've seen are between one and a half billion and 2.3 billion pounds are uncovered utility requirements between now and 2040. If you contrast that to annual production of maybe 140, 145 million pounds this year, it, it's a pretty big um, gap that the industry needs to rise up and, and fill. And uh, that obviously is a big challenge, but it's obviously creating huge opportunities, particularly for some of the, the small and mid-cap um, uranium companies, which I'm sure you're gonna, we're going to hear from later today. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, the easy pounds to put on the ground are, are restarting brownfields. There's an absolute scramble to get mines restarted. Cameco kicked us off in early 22. But you can see that the number of companies that have announced restarts has really widened, which is really good. That is obviously uh, going to translate into very uh, positive uh, developments for these companies. And I think investors are responding accordingly. Um, I just had a quick look at how much capital has come into 
the uranium mining ETFs year to date. And my quick tally is about 500 million US dollars, uh, which is really good. Uh, that's just year to date. If I contrast that with how much money has come into the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust so far this year, it's $56 million. And what I attribute that to is that as the uranium price has broken through 80 and 90 and touched 100, this is disproportionately benefiting the uranium mining stocks. This is putting investors, I think, in a more risk on appetite, which uh, up until August of last year, they were, they were a little bit gun shy in terms of investing in a lot of the uranium mining stocks. So I think this is a very healthy development. At, and at this point in the cycle, uh, I think it's it's playing out exactly as you would think. The commodity price is really starting to lift the mining stocks, which underperformed the commodity price for almost two years. All right, let's keep going. Um, so the uranium price uh, in, in spot market nominal terms going back, um, I think our main message here is the bull market is intact. Um, we think this bull market is going to resemble more like the bull market of the 1970s uh, that was driven by a big shift in energy policy. When the price of uranium hit $100, we had a lot of people you know, reaching out to us saying, oh my gosh, it's $100, is like the bull market over. And it's like, no, not a chance. You know, where, where $100 is, is basically where we were if you inflation adjust the price in 2011. Uh, that's 72 bucks right before the, the tsunami in Japan. If um, you inflation adjust the other two uh, bull market cycle uh, peaks, and I'll show you that slide now, uh, we're still a long ways off. So right now, the uranium price today is around $88. Uh, we have come back from, from 106. But uh, I'm going to borrow that. I borrowed this from the Bank of America. They basically inflation adjusted the two previous peak prices of uranium for some kind of a nominal uh, U.S. inflation rate, and they've basically said that um, in today in today's dollars terms, the price in the 1970s peaked out around $170 a pound, and in the commodity super cycle in 2007, it would be equivalent to $200 a pound. So our belief is very consistent with this: that we're we're well, uh, we're, uh, 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 be, we still have quite a bit of room to grow before we hit peak uranium cycle pricing, and that's just really about the uncovered requirements that I showed you on the previous slide being well over a billion and a half pounds. Um, so bull market is still intact. Last few weeks, I would say, just to give you some color on the spot market, we definitely had an air pocket in the spot market. Uh, and as Andrew said, the spot market is a, is, a, is a very different market than the term market where the bulk of the pounds get transacted. Um, Perry will talk a little bit about what he's seeing in the in the term market in a moment. But in the spot market in the last few weeks, I'm going to chalk it up to almost like a buyer strike. As the price kind of broke through $100, we definitely have seen some parties step away from the market. They just felt like it was running too hot, too fast, uh, and they clearly did not want to push it up any further. So we've seen uh, some buyers step away. In that vacuum that was created, and we did not have any real, you know, meaningful amount of cash to deploy in that pocket. What you often see in the uranium market is traders will come to market, and because they are long this exposure, they do not have an effective and efficient way to hedge their positions like they would in other commodities. They sometimes have to clear the pounds off their balance sheet, and when that happens, it's just you know you walk the price down until you clear it. It feels as though a week and a half ago, we had one of those market clearing days where, you know, we think somewhere between 250 to 500,000 pounds cleared. The price hit around $83. We had, we we stepped in that day and bought 50,000 pounds at 84. And right now we're trading, as I said, we've got a bid of 88 and an offer of $90 today. So the market seems to have had its moment. Uh, we've, we've definitely seen buyers in the last week step back in the market, pick away, um, at what we think are still attractive prices. Uh, the reality is the utilities obviously have uncovered requirements. Uh, producers, we know, uh, if they have any production issues, uh, will have to sometimes come into the spot market as well. And last year, we think somewhere around 25% of the material in the spot market was actually purchased by utilities. So utilities, when the material is available, will nibble away at the spot market when, when prices are attractive. But Again, you know, this is a market that is not like natural gas, where if there's a squeeze or a shortage, you know, there's a panic. Utilities have two, three, sometimes more years of inventory on hand. If the market gets too hot or 
or they got to go back and get more, you know, permissions to get more capital to buy. It's very easy for them to step away and let the market take a breather. And I think that's exactly what, what they've done the last couple of weeks. So we remain very constructive on the market. Um, just to give you a little bit of color on, on the market in the last few months, I, I would say that the, the, the most meaningful thing, and, and Para is going to get into more detail on this, the most meaningful thing from our perspective and what we've been watching for months and months and months has been Kazat and Prom. And the reason we watch them is because as the world's largest and lowest cost producer, they are in the best position to respond to this higher pricing with supply. And back at the end of September, they told the market when we hit $72 a pound that they were going to flex production up uh, this year and next. The market, after about a $5 correction, almost discounted it and, and just kept marching higher. And in the last few weeks, they basically told us there will not be any production increase this year. And they're not telling anybody what the production profile will be for 2025 until August at the earliest, which to us feels like another surprise in terms of uh, you know challenges with production. If we can't if we if we can't see the the largest producer flexing up production at 80 or 90 or 100 or term contracts that we think are 120 to 130 dollars right now, I think that is very important to, to watch. Uh, and at the end of the day, all of these commodity bull markets end when there's a massive supply response. And if the two largest suppliers in the market are basically signaling that they're either going to be disciplined about supply or they're having supply issue, you know, challenges, either short or intermediate term, I think it just stretches this bull market out ever longer. So that's something that we're, we're paying very close attention to uh, between now and, 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 and August. I don't think we're going to get much clarity on that issue but our sense is it's a multi-year uh issue that uh that won't be solved um okay so let me just talk a little bit about spot um we have almost 64 million pounds in inventory uh which is valued at over five and a half billion dollars um we have purchased over 45 million pounds since the trust uh, was created we have not sold we have not sold a single pound we have not lent out a single pound material goes in, it gets sequestered. Uh, what we have noticed it, it, since September of last year is we have really seen a shift in interest in uranium from the first wave of investors was very specialized, specialty funds, a lot of hedge funds, a lot of family offices, specialty mandate funds focused on clean energy and, and whatnot, energy transition. Since September, it's been very, very broad in terms of generalist investors, from around the world that are poking around and saying, hey, why did this commodity go up 89% last year when most other commodities uh, struggled? Uh, so we've had, a, we've had record amounts of inbound interest from institutional investors that are becoming, I would say, larger in, in the amount of capital they're running and also, I would say, more generalists. Now, are they all rushing to buy into the space? No, they're not, but they're all doing their work. They're all intrigued. Uh, and what we often find is that because the market is opaque, it often takes them quite a bit of time to piece it all together, write their investment memos, you know, sell the idea to their investment committee or CIO. So it's a little bit slower. It's a slower process than I would say the first movers that we experienced in 2020 and uh, 21 and 22 that had really done their homework on the uranium supply deficit story and got positioned early. So we still think there's lots of interest uh, at the same time, is BlackRock calling and saying, "Hey, I've got hundreds of millions of dollars to put in the sector"? No, they're not. They're not anywhere near the sector yet. It's 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 not a crowded trade by by any means. So, um, so that just shows you the growth in pounds over time. Um, so we just, you know, we've obviously slowed down our purchases. I I think the main takeaway I would leave you with is that last year, as I mentioned, the price of uranium went up eighty nine percent. And we only bought four million pounds. So what was really driving that price was obviously the utilities coming back to market and procuring ever more amounts of uranium. This year we've purchased 450,000 pounds. Uh, the vehicle is as transparent as you can make it. Every day we update our website with the pounds purchased. Um, and this just basically shows you the cumulative pounds purchased and uh, all the daily activity. Right now, I think we're trading 
at a very small discount uh, to NAV. The discount over the last few weeks has been quite narrow. Uh, at one point last week, it got to 90 basis points. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that the trust cannot uh, issue new units in the market unless we're trading at a premium to the previous day NAV. It, so my takeaway, your takeaway there is we're really not that far away to getting back in a position to raise new capital and, and come back into the spot market, which we think would have an immediate impact uh, given the spot market remains fairly tight. So we're hopeful if we can get institutional interest, uh, it doesn't take much to close that gap and we get back to buying more uranium. Um, so this basically just gives you the spot uh, market price, which is in green against the, its net asset value. You can see generally they've traded quite tight. Uh, when there has been a dislocation, you can see it's they generally tend to be short-lived. They tend to be value buying opportunities because the discount tends to close. And you can see right now the discount uh, is very, very tight. And that's a good sign. Uh, it's a good barometer of overall general, I would say, sentiment in the sector. Um, what we have analyzed in the past is when we see those dislocations, it's not necessarily negative sentiment around uranium. It tends to be negative sentiment about interest rates, interest rate tightening by the Federal Reserve or general commodity sell-offs. Uh, that seems to be the highest kind of correlation between those events. So just in summary, um, there's been a huge shift back to nuclear energy for, for all the reasons I out, outlined. We do not see uh, the structural supply deficit getting solved anytime soon, despite a tripling of prices the last three years. We could see a meaningful supply response 2028 at the earliest, perhaps 2030. The midterm market is incredibly tight. If you talk to the major producers, they'll tell you they're largely sold out for the next few years which I think is pretty mind boggling. Uh, and I think our main takeaway is uranium prices, we believe are gonna remain higher for longer. Uh, the, the industry is not gonna benefit if we just have a short term blip and spike in price, because the reality is, as we know, these projects are long dated, they are capital intensive, um, and we need the price to stay elevated in the, in the term market particularly, so that projects get financed. And I would just, I would just uh, mention that, you know, we believe the recent correction uh, is a short lived correction, which is very healthy in a sustained bull market and provides a, a, an attractive entry point for investors who, in many cases, we talked to kind of kicked themselves and said, uh, you know, I kind of dragged my feet a little bit last year and, and I didn't pull the trigger. We think this is an attractive uh, entry point. So maybe I'm going to pause there and um I know Pear is on the phone. Um, we can either take questions or um, have maybe Pear uh, add some color on what he's seeing in the term market with contracts and then open it up for questions. Up to you, Andrew. Yeah, look, John, why don't we continue with that uh, with Pear and then we'll do some uh, some questions for, for you and Pear uh, combined. So, Pear, if right. you'll uh, take yourself off mute and uh, um, appreciate your insight. So those who don't know Pear Jander, uh, he is um, he's at WMC, uh, rebranded from WCM Energy just recently. He's the director of nuclear fuel and investor services, and he's the uh, leading consultant to uh, to, to um, John and the and the team at Spart on uh, on their nuclear uh, nuclear industry. Uh, his background is he's had ten years with uh, with Cameco prior to um, joining uh, WMC, where he was um, uh, doing the um, uranium sales and marketing for Cameco. So uh, you know, very experienced in the industry, and uh, his insights are always. Uh, always well worth listening to. So, uh, Per, over to you. All right, uh, thank you, Andrew. I uh, I can't see my uh, I can't see myself on the screen. It looks pretty dark. I got my video turned on, but uh, I'm not sure if you uh, <laughs> if you don't yeah, we... want me to be seen or not. But uh, I uh, I can try to turn it on. But it's uh, yeah, it seems it seems like I have everything on anyway. But uh, I can try to stop it and turn it back on. But either way, I can also talk to it. You can. You can just look at John instead. As long as you can hear me, that's fine. So Go we ahead. can hear you. Bro. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, that's uh, that's good enough. So, <laughs> so anyway, as, uh, as I'll build on a couple of the things that John talked about, and then uh, and then I'll uh, I'll save some time for uh, for answering questions as well, certainly. So, uh, so what John mentioned, obviously, it's like there's been some interesting activity in the spot market lately, or lack of activity almost. Um, 
because uh, it was right around the time of the uh, earnings calls from both Cassatum Prom and Cameco. Uh, there was uh, obviously Cam like Cassatum Prom came out and said that they they obviously going to revise the production forecast for this year down quite a bit. Uh, that had clearly a bit of a bullish impact. And then I think a lot of people were expecting Cameco to have something similar uh, in terms of uh, when it came to uh, production issues. Turns out they didn't, uh, which a lot of investors I think saw as a bearish sign. And I, even Cameco's uh, stock got hammered pretty hard, even though it was actually a pretty good outcome for them. But, uh, but still, you know, I think it was just an overall expectation. So what you saw then was that, uh, like like John referred to as well, it was a bit of a buyer strike that, that like investors moved away, which investors do drive a lot of the of the of the buyer interest in the spot market. When we hit hundred right around that time, we're just over a hundred dollars a pound in the spot market. Uh, the other portion of buyers who have been there that John referred to as well, the utilities they stepped away. They, uh, like John said too, they can they can afford to take a bit of a pause if they want to. Um, also, that most of their activity is in the term market. So if you're if they have a mandate to buy in the spot market, if they think it's affordable, they they will get that from their management and they won't focus that much on on term procurement and tender processes. But uh, but as soon as you hit the hundred, you just notice that all the utilities got quiet and. As, as we at WMC, we work a lot with utilities on, on their term uh, contracting. So whether it's through tender processes or just bilateral discussions off market, we did see a fairly significant increase in the term activity. So they all moved away from the spot market and started picking up the term activity. Now, this is obviously a process that you don't do in a week or two, but it had been percolating for some time and it clearly got triggered uh, by the inc sharp increase in the spot market too. So we haven't seen any utilities at all in the spot market, but they have switched to term contracting. I mean, I've been quite busy traveling in, in Europe and, and the Middle East, which is the areas that I cover for utilities. And my colleagues here in the US have also been very, very busy. So there's a lot of uh, tenders out. There's a lot of off-market con contract discussions with utilities. And then when you saw the market come down to 84, a lot of utilities thought, okay, well, this is actually a lot more affordable than I can get from producers, but in order for them to pivot, it takes quite a while. They might need board decisions. They clearly need management uh, approval from some kind of, uh, you know, they, they might have committees that only only meet every few weeks, so they can they cannot act very quickly. And uh, so we haven't seen them come back. And now when the market's turned around again, we certainly haven't seen any utilities that have abandoned their term contracting plans just to kind of switch back again to the to the spot market. Um, and, and another thing that John touched on too, which is sort of a, a result of a lot of the big producers being sold out for the coming few years, is that we have a fairly significant crunch and not just now in the spot market, but say 25, 26, 27, when you, if you ask Cameco and Cassatum Prom, they will tell you that they're sold out and, and as are a lot of other big, uh, big producers as well. So post 2028, yeah, that's a different story. We'll see what happens. There's a lot of uncertainties that needs to be worked through, but these near term years, uh, and talking to utilities as well, they say like the prices there are very, very steep to a point of we were only hours away from actually being able to lock out a carry trade despite the high interest prices right now, where we basically would just buy material in the spot market, find someone to finance it for it at the current rate and just sell it to a utility out in time. Uh, and at 84, 85, 86 dollars a pound, that was definitely feasible. So that. The, the term market is very opaque, so you don't really know what the prices are doing out there, but that's at least an indicator for for where are the big uh, the big producers asking for prices. And we were close to it. So I would say, even though it's it's still a little opaque, what is going on in the term market, at least that price 85 ish is you can certainly see it as a floor because at that point, trading companies as ourselves can easily step in and just do a carry trade. So that tells you something at least of where uh, where the producers are. And uh, when you have the news that came out from Cassatum Prom, that in my view was actually, I would say almost um, not overlooked by the investment community, but I don't think everybody realized the, the magnitude of it. If, if a company like Cassatum Prom 
revise the production forecast from just four months earlier to say that, oh yeah, by the way, we're not going to make 7 million pounds this year. That has an impact. It might not have an impact in the spot market right away, but the contracting activity that's going to be going on from utilities, certainly this year, and as we don't know what's happening in 2025, but I wholeheartedly agree with John on that. I don't think it's a good sign that they're not they're not announcing anything about 2025 right now. Uh, this is likely to to keep going for a bit, and some utilities are genuinely concerned. Where are we going to find our pounds in the next two three years? And uh, it is not a slam dunk where they're going to come from. And and of course you can buy them in the spot market or via a trading company and then finance it that way too. But then that means you're going to have an impact on the spot market, and the spot market is very much thinner today than it was only a couple of years ago. So if you buy 500,000, a million pounds today, the market will move and it will move by, by dollars, not cents. So that's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. And uh, and it, it is everything most slow, moves slowly in the nuclear market. Um, I completely understand that investment aren't necessarily as patient as someone who's been in the nuclear industry for 20 years, but it's... Uh, to me, it's uh, there's quite a lot of activity going on right now, and it's a very exciting time in the market. And and this year is uh, is certainly there's uh, there there's a lot of anticipation coming, and I do not think that we've seen the high for the year. I'm quite certain we haven't. So I think we're gonna see higher prices as we as we move further this year. Uh, just the last thing I will touch on too that John mentioned, and I probably will. Uh, I do think that Triva will talk about too is uh, is the potential Russian sanctions that. There is a lot of talk about that, and will it impact the market right away? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, but the clear has been there's some hurdles, and one of them has been that the the U.S. will not impose sanctions until it has secured funding for the domestic uh, nuclear fuel chain to build out the conversion and enrichment capacity, because that's where Russia is quite dominant today. Now, well, that budget has passed, so the $2.7 billion has been uh, allocated now. So that hurdle is gone. And I think everybody active in, in the nuclear fuel market is expecting the sanctions to come. It's just a matter of when. Um, but nevertheless, even though if you're a utility and you're expecting them to come, that doesn't necessarily give you authority or give you the 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 weight in in your discussions internally to alloc to have someone allocate you that budget. So as soon as you have it obviously written in law that there are sanctions in place, you can have a very different conversation with your management and management will probably talk to you. And and I think then you it, you'll be a lot more flexibility in the budget you're you're allowed to spend at that point. So definitely something to keep an eye on as well over the next uh, one or two months for sure. So that was just a briefly touch on it. I'll uh, I'll be happy to uh, to pause here and then open up for for any questions and more comments from John. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Bill. Very interesting insights. And uh, look, I you know I'd really be interested in your thoughts, um, both yourself and John, around a comment you made there, which I think you're actually spot on. Is is the outlook for Cameco? Um, you know the, the the Cameco recent result. I think the market was looking for the similar thing with Cans Adam Primers and production downgrades, and I think the market was also um, surprised at how little um, uh, Cameco is intending to buy in the spot market this year. I think they, in their commentary they said only two million pounds, even though they've got a shortfall of of seven or eight in terms of their their contract book. So um, I think Cameco are intending potentially to go and borrow material from 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 sources to make up that that shortfall. So look, you know, given that your background at Cameco and uh, given you're both uh, in Canada and probably closer to the situation than we are here, down here in Australia, your insights into the Cameco production numbers this year, you know, have they just kicked the can down the road? Are there going to be production cuts from you know, MacArthur River Cigar Lake at some point or, or do, you, do you think that they can actually achieve these production targets they've met? Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, I, I can't comment on the production numbers, whether they're going to meet them or not. I, I I worked there and I and I used to visit the mines and I know that they have as good of an operations team as any mining company, I would say, extremely talented people, but it is challenging mining. There's no doubt about that. You, you're you freezing the ground, you're working 500 meters on the ground and you have to freeze it. Otherwise you get water packed sandstone, you poke a hole in that and you, get, you flood the mine. It, it, it's very, very challenging. But what I will say is that when when I worked at Cameco, that if there were any production shortages, you don't necessarily have to go into the spot market and buy right away. Your first, I would say, resort would be 
talk to utility customers and see, do you really need everything right away? Or can we, like you mentioned, kick the can down the road? We'll just, we'll deliver it to you, but maybe one or two years out and you give, you give the utility a bit of a break for that. So I'm sure Chemical are having those discussions. Uh, to a certain point, you can do it to a certain extent, but it's also, I would say utilities now, they probably see Chemical as one of the crown jewels in their in their in the contract portfolio that these are the pounds we're really relying on. We can't afford to take any risks on it. So um, yeah, I would we have seen a couple of producers, I won't name them, uh, coming to the spot market over the last uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so clearly these prices aren't too high for them. Um, but uh there's definitely been a return. Even last week, there was a there was about a million pounds contracted, and and at least talking directly to some traders or acting on behalf of producers, and uh, yeah, it's not all that is captured in the in the open market or the what the what the trade associations are writing. So it's uh, there is definitely things going on, and and I think just the activity last week is just. Uh, at least a first sign that yeah producers are and buyers are on the way back to the market yeah great um yeah the, the spot market as you say has become very thin recently my, my understanding john is that um you know a big change last year was that bht no longer sell their material from olympic dam into the spot market they've they've shifted that into um into into a term uh, uh, selling process which you know, I think they were the biggest supplier of pounds into the into the spot market. So, yeah, you know, the, the market is quite thin now. Look, even, even if you were trading above NAV, I mean, is the market big enough there? If you wanted to go and buy a million pounds in the spot market over the next month, is it is it possible to do that? Well, two years ago, I mean, we, we could go in the spot market and buy a million pounds with a little bit of work over a day or two. Um, now, my sense is it would probably take us a couple of weeks. Um, there's always material coming into the spot market. But I would say the most meaningful change that we've experienced is as the prices hit new milestones, uh, we have not seen a wave of material kind of come out of the woodwork. So, you know, two years ago when the price broke out from 30 to 50, you know, all kinds of people were, were, were you know, phoning us saying, oh, my God, it's at 50 bucks. We haven't, you know, seen the price at, like this for, for years. You know, we would love to sell you the pounds. What was interesting is as the, as the price hit 60 and 70 and 80 and 90, we have not seen a wave of material come to the market um, like we did in the past. And I think that's a reflection of utilities have been buying uh, to bolster their inventories. Uh, producers have been buying. And uh, I would just say that generally there's just less mobile inventory because a lot of it has been sequestered, not only in our vehicle, but but other vehicles, other funds, um, you know, we know hedge funds uh, have been active in the in the spot market as well. So, as you know, as Per mentioned, it, it doesn't take a lot for, for the market to move one way or the other, uh, because it is, it's become a lot, uh, a lot tighter. Yeah, great. One of the, your charts you put up showed uh, quite a significant amount of supply um, from the carry trade um, over the last you know, three, four, five years. And I mean, clearly that has to be the case given the um, you know, annual demand of 180 million pounds and supply of 140 clearly inventories have to be making up a lot of that that balance. And it looked like that uh, carry trade has really, you know, wound off to, to very little volumes uh, now. You know, it's just not not uh, financially viable for, for traders to do that. W what's your sense of that carry trade market? Is anyone still, you know, trying to play that game? And what, how do you get visibility on the levels of inventory in the industry, which you know, we struggle to you know, get a read on what inventories are out there and, and whether we've come to the end of this this massive destock phase over the last 10 years? Sure, maybe I'll, I'll hand that to Per. Yeah, sure, and I actually managed to make up the video work. That was 100% my fault. I apparently don't work with Zoom enough, but... Uh, well, good uh, to but see you, Per. Oh, yeah. It's nice to see you too. On the inventory side, um, I think it, it's very difficult to get a, a clear view of it. You can you can read enormous numbers from China that they have 500 million pounds in inventory, and and maybe they do, but that material is not going to come to the market. They 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 have a, a very rapidly expanding nuclear program in China, and they don't have any domestic mines whatsoever. So. They might buy and sell a little bit at the same time, but they are a very large net buyer and it's a sig significant strategic asset for them that I just can't see a lot of pounds coming from China into the market on a consistent basis. Um, 
overall on the global level, I would say that the 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 global levels of inventories are almost at an all time low. Uh, John mentioned we're not at replacement rates when it comes to contracting right now. They're almost across the board. Utilities have been drawing down inventories over the last few years. So if you look at historic levels, um, I have not seen them as low as they are now. And one, one little good tidbit as well is that when we hit $105, so almost at the absolute peak, there was one Japanese utility that uh, that through an intermediary had about one reloads worth for one reactor. And that was a utility that's very close to the uh, to the earthquake zone that happened, the re very recent earthquake. So they pushed out the restart by one year uh, and that freed up uh, a reloads worth of U38 for them. And that came, came to the market. But that's essentially what it takes. It takes a, a reactor that knows for certain that they're not going to run for another year or it's going to delay the restart with another year and you're in a $105 market. And it was half a million pounds and it, it took about half a day to place it, I think. So it's uh, there is definitely a need for it and I don't see any large hidden mountains of uranium sitting there that's going to come and flood into the market. Where, where, where does a group like Cameco then source its shortfall if it's not buying on the spot market and it's um, you know it needs to find six million pounds of uranium to meet its its contract commitments for this year? Where does that come from? Yeah, I don't know what's included in uh, in that. There might be that they have their I don't know if the, the purchases from Kazakhstan are included there or not because they normally show up as purchases they have to make, but uh, but they're they're basically the regular purchases that they get on a contractual basis from Kassadam Prom. So I don't know if they need to buy 6 million pounds, but it's, uh, I, I do think they will be in the market uh, off and on this year, but I don't think they're going to be there in a very, uh, in a significant sense. Cause if you look at their average uh, sales price, it's in the high fifties. So it doesn't really make any sense for them to buy it elevated levels here anyway can they buy a few million pounds because they have high pride contracts absolutely but i don't think we're going to see that amount of buying but i also think that they will just they will work to restructure contracts with their customers and this like i say kick the can down the road but that means that you're going to have a tighter situation for longer yeah okay um just your insights on this um russian uh, uh sanctions bill our understanding is it has passed Congress. It's been uh, passed by, uh, by by that House. It's been held up in the Senate. Have you got any insights in you know, why the Senate is, is not passing that bill at this stage and what's holding it up? Well, so far, it's Ted Cruz who's holding it up. It's the Republican uh, senator from Texas because he basically wants a semiconductor factory. So it's basically horse trading, which is frustrating, but it's, uh, it, it is one of the reasons why it's been held up. I think now, and Treva will be better to speak about this when, when she comes on, but there are more than one avenue now, like this 1042, that bill with the with, with would be sanctions in 2028, and there would be uh, some kind of waivers issued by DOE that uh, utilities can work with. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, there is also talk of that it's possible that Biden and his administration just gets fed up with Ted Cruz and will just actually issue an executive order and, and have sanctions that way, because they certainly can. And then I think there was a third bill as well that potentially would have sanctions in it that would not be tied to uh, to this other bill that was being held up by Ted Cruz. But it, so there are a few different avenues, but it's it's regardless of how many avenues there are, I think most people think it is gonna happen. And I was just reading in, in the report from Friday on an, an EUP delivery. So this is enriched uranium product delivery from St. Petersburg bound for uh, Baltimore, I think, in the U.S., so going to U.S. utilities. It had to make a routine stop in Germany, uh, just where the, the liner is just not, because EUP is very, very dense. Like, you, you only have a little bit of that, and you have something else on the ship, too. So, But they had to make a stop in Germany, and apparently it was held there uh, because the ballast in the boat is made out of plywood, and plywood is on the sanctions list. Now, uranium is not, but plywood is. So the Germans are not letting it out of the port. So even if there's not sanctions, there's so many different things that can go wrong. It's like, and obviously all the line, there's only a couple of ships that can handle it. Um, there is uh, there is insurance issues. So I think every US utility that is relying on Russian material, they're doing whatever they can to get it onshore in the US as soon as possible, because the system is so fragile at this point. There, there's so many things that can go wrong. Yeah. 
Um, because Adam Prom is, is, as you said, is is a, a key area of focus for everybody, the world's largest producer. And uh, as you say, they um, they haven't given us guidance now for, for 2025. They've, they're going to withhold that till August. Um, can you just give the audience here a little bit of an insight into you know, what's causing the production problems at Kaz Adam Prom? I think blaming it on, on uh, sulfuric acid availability, but is there a more fundamental issue with the, um, the production assets of Kaz Adam Prom? The, if there's a fundamental problem, it's hard to tell. I don't know enough about it and I haven't been there. And it's also the Kazakhs are, are naturally not very forthcoming on this either. Uh, but the the narrative has changed a little bit from going from we can't find sulfuric acid uh, for the life of us, so we can't produce as much, to there may be sulfuric acid, but we don't want to pay for it. Uh, because it is triple the price of what it used to be, and 60% of your production cost in, in an ISR mine is going to be the sulfuric acid. So it's severely going to impact the production economics. Now, does it make sense to produce it when uranium is $100 a pound? 100%. But there, I mean, the, the, the Catholics aren't stupid. They're pretty savvy people there. So they might take a valuable volume approach and just say like, okay, we'll just produce less. We'll sell it at a higher price and we get the same revenue anyway. And we save the pounds for a rainy day. So there could be some of that there too. There's a there's a big industry conference in about uh, three weeks time in Kazakhstan. So you'll have a lot of people from uh, from yeah the global nuclear fuel industry head to Kazakhstan, and that will clearly be one on the. It's not on the official agenda, but on the unofficial agenda, everybody's going to try to kick the tires and find find something about this anyway. So me included for sure. Yeah, indeed. Um, back back to the utilities and term contracting. Um, so uh, you mentioned that you know that they clearly they, they're covered for this year and next. There's no you know no sense of panic from the utilities that they're not going to have uranium for the next two years. Um, but, but it does start to look like they are very undercovered. You know, 26, 27, 28, and it's difficult to see where that new supply comes from. You know, what's your expectation from the behaviour of the utilities? They seem to move as a as a pack, and you know, no one wants to be the first that's out there. You know, buying first. Is there going to come a panic moment some point this year where uh, the utilities say, oh, my God, we just haven't got the supply. We're going to have to pay whatever we need. I mean, it's uh, I, I would say every utility is different. Sure, there are some like, there may be cohorts that are it's like move as a group. But uh, but overall, they have very different approaches. Some are very comfortable where they sit. They have no Russian, no Russian uh, deliveries whatsoever. They have plenty of inventory. So they're just sitting back and are very opportunistic when they do buy. And then there are some that are on the verge of irresponsibly uncovered. And it might be some of their own fault. It might be some of the mergers discussions and they've just sort of inherited the portfolio that no one has been touching for two we two years because it's been neglected. Uh, or it could be in the, in Europe, for example, when you have the, uh, uh, the uh, VVER reactor operators, so the Russian design reactors, um, they get life of plant supply from Russia uh, as part of the deal when they when they buy the reactor. But obviously, they have to pay for the fuel, but they still have everything is designed and made for in Russia. They basically just get, here's your loading pad and put these ones on the deeds dates and you're fine and let us know when you want more. Now they've been told by the Uranium Supply Agency, so basically the one of the uh, authorities in Europe overseeing this, that uh, from a security supply perspective, you can't buy from, uh, from Russia anymore. So you have to go out and find it somewhere else. And that's what we've been seeing over the last few years. And we are still seeing uh, some tenders who are replacing uh, this uh, this Russian production. And, uh, and and it's pretty chunky. So that's clearly having an impact. And it's not at all based on utilities just sitting on their hands. Um, but even though there are some of those cases too, but, uh, but there's still, uh, they're forced to come into the market at a very, and that's part of the reason why you've seen both enrichment and conversion has gone three, four X in the last few years. So. Yeah, indeed. Look, that, gentlemen, that's been absolutely fantastic. I thank you so much for your time today. Um, John and Per, um, your insights are always uh, extremely valuable. And, uh, you know, it is a fascinating juncture we're at in this industry. And, you know, uh, John, congratulations to you and your team of, of picking this very early and, uh, you know, putting the Sputnik vehicle in place. And you've, you've made your investors a, a lot of money in the last three years with that with that vision. So well done. And um, yeah, hopefully you start to uh, to trade a little bit above your, your, your NAV at some point. And uh, we, we see you back in the, the spot market again. And, uh you know, our, our forecast of $150 uranium price by the end of next year might might come to fruition. So, um, yeah, thank you again for your time. And uh, 
we'll, uh, we'll get you back on the next conference. Thank you. Thanks.